You're listening to The Wild Initiative Podcast Network. Learn more and check out all the shows at thewildinitiative.com. You're listening to the Fish Untamed podcast, where we talk all things fishing, conservation, and the outdoors. Today on the show, I'm joined by Scott Bossy, the Northern Rockies Director of American Rivers. All right, welcome to episode number 16 of the Fish Untamed podcast. Today, I am talking to Scott Bossy with American Rivers. And what we're mostly getting into today is the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. Wild and Scenic Rivers are a set of rivers that have been designated uh, for protection due to some of the qualities they possess. The way Scott describes what, what makes a river eligible for the Wild and Scenic designation is that it needs to be free-flowing and have one or more outstandingly remarkable values, which I thought was just such a wonderful way to describe so many of the rivers that we love to get out on and fish. What I was surprised by was that these outstandingly remarkable values don't have to be something related to just a picturesque landscape with you know, beautiful mountains in the background and forests. And Some of these rivers flow through major metropolitan areas, but because they hold values in, within the community and the people who live near them, uh, they're eligible and have since been designated as wild and scenic. So even if you're already familiar with wild and scenic rivers or have maybe fished a handful, uh, I think you'll probably learn a lot about them that you didn't know before. So without further ado, here is my chat with Scott Bossy. I just usually like to start by asking how you got your background in fishing and conservation. Oh, I have always been in love with water and with fish. Um, I grew up part of my life in northern New York State. Um, and when I was a little kid, I bought a fly rod and reel at a garage sale, and I didn't know how to use it, so I put worms on the hook, but I thought it was cool to have a fly rod, and I'd ride my bike to the local stream and catch brookies. <laughs> and then um, I also spent part of the year, uh, every year growing up in South Florida, and my dad was a golf pro. And we'd move there every winter, and I lived on a canal that was loaded with shiners and large enough bass and bullhead. And pretty much every day, for about eight hours a day, I would fish. I'd go out on my own and, and uh, you know, try and catch alligators and shiners, and then I'd put the shiners on the hook and fish for a <laughs> uh, large enough bass. So I've been in love with water and fishing since as long as I can remember. And then I was a fishing guide for a short period of time. Uh, I was a commercial fisherman in Alaska for four years for salmon and halibut and cod. And then I became a fishery biologist for several years before I started going to work for nonprofit river conservation groups. So yeah, fish have been the story of my life. I wanted to ask you about um, some of those so those previous um, experiences, mostly just the uh, the guiding and especially the commercial fishing. Like. Can you give a, a brief overview of what that entailed? Yeah, well, it's, it's really funny because when I guided, my fish, my fly fishing skills were probably the worst um, they've ever been because it was the <laughs> first year I started fly fishing. And I was working on a guest ranch on the east side of the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming. And a buddy taught me how to fly fish that summer. And later that fall, the ranch owner said, you know, we could really use someone to guide our clients on the guest ranch and, and teach them how to catch trout in the local stream. And I was like, well, I just kind of learned, I mean, I know a lot about fish and fishing, but this fly fishing thing's pretty new to me. And she's like, oh, that's, that's not a problem. So uh, <laughs> You're putting worms <laughs> on their hooks? Like, this is how I do it. <laughs> I did not put worms on the hooks, but it was like a little brushy stream where you didn't need to be able to double haul, like you didn't need to uh. cast very far. It was like a lot of bow and arrow cast, you know, to avoid the willows. And, you know, the fish were pretty willing in that stream. So that was my initiation to, to guiding, if you will. And then I did it the next year as well. Um, and then commercial fishing in Alaska, I did that 
in my mid twenties. And, um, I had some good friends that I met while teaching skiing in Colorado down in winter park. And they came from Alaska and they had families that had homesteaded there and did commercial fish their whole adult lives. And they said, come on up, I'll get you a job with my family. And yeah, I decided why not? And so I did it <laughs> and, um, had lots of great adventures, um, purse for salmon, long lining for cod and halibut, uh, set gill netting for salmon on Cook Inlet, a lot of different types of fishing. But, um, you know, I, I really, uh, unlike a lot of fly fishermen, I actually can see the world from a, a commercial fisher's viewpoint as mm -hmm. well. And it's pretty cool to have the opportunity to fish for a family that literally homesteaded in Alaska and like took a boat up there and, and uh, you know, took a barge to the east shore of Cook Inlet and lived their first winter in a cave in the bluff and then built a house <laughs> next year. You know, like it's it was really, really cool. And I have a lot of respect for those people and what they do. And it's interesting to observe the tensions um, over my adult life between the guiding community and the commercial fishing community, because they're certainly there. I was going to ask if uh, having that job kind of changed your view on fishing just like recreational fishing um and you kind of covered it there but did it did it change the way you felt about it or how fun you found it did you find yourself um you know be wanting to be around fish less because you know you're doing it all the time like how, how did your your experiences fly fishing change based on that no it, it's funny because both commercial fishing and sport fishing are all about exploring and discovery and mystery mm -hmm. and just wondering what lurks under the surface. So I actually think there's a lot of similarities. And even though like in sport fishing, I'm, I'm almost entirely a catch and release angler, um, except with like halibut and salmon, you know, mm -hmm. they taste pretty darn good. Um, but you know i have an appreciation for fish whether it's for sport or whether it's for food or whether it's for money and i think they're really kind of sacred animals and i treat them with respect regardless of whether i'm commercial fishing or sport fishing mm -hmm. and then after these jobs you is this when you transitioned over more into the advocacy work that you do now yeah, I kind of, I went back to grad school and finished my master's degree in environmental studies at the University of Montana in 1993. So it was after I commercial fished for four years and pretty much uh, went to work as a fishery biologist for the next five or six years. And um, from then on out, I've been an advocate for river and fisheries conservation organizations. And you've worked with, is it the Greater Yellowstone Coalition? And yep. what, was the um, other, what was the other organization? I also worked for uh, a statewide river conservation group in Idaho called Idaho Rivers United. That was it, yep. And then um, before that, I, I, I worked uh, a short stint as a fisheries research biologist for the Nature Conservancy in Oregon. Okay. And is that how you um, got connected with American Rivers? Or um, I, I assume that, you know, one work leads into the next. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because... Um, you know, working as a fishery biologist, I found really fascinating. I loved getting into the field every day and discovering new things about fish and their life histories and, you know, what water temperatures they can tolerate and how far upstreams and over waterfalls they can colonize where you never think they would be. But after a while of doing that, I started wondering where my research was going. Like what was happening to that information? Was it translating? into new policies that resulted in more protections for fish and more protections for rivers. And the more I asked that question, the more I kind of found out that um, what was fun being a biologist, that information was not being put to good use. And uh, my life is all, it's been about making change. And that's what really drew me into advocacy is I wanted that information to be put to use on the ground in the form of healthier rivers and restored fish runs. That, that raises a, another question. Is that, and you might not know the answer to this, but do you think that that's something common across the board with a lot of fisheries biologists, um, that a lot of the time what could be useful information just isn't being used properly? Or was that more your specific circumstance? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's difficult to survive working for a state or federal agency when there's kind of political forces above you that prevent you from being outspoken in support of your science. Mm -hmm. um, like a classic example is, is the whole issue of Colombian snake river salmon recovery. There's some I mean, industry of biologists that work on that issue and billions of dollars have been spent on that over the last 30 years. And most biologists that really know what they're talking about, they know what needs to be done to restore those salmon and steelhead runs. But for political purposes, they're, they're literally prevented from speaking in public about that issue. There, there have literally been periods in the state of Idaho where the governor imposed a gag order and fishery biologists working for the state of Idaho were not allowed to even talk to the public about Snake River salmon recovery and dam removal. That's crazy. And that's a pretty useful piece of information because I feel like there's a lot of people out there who would want to get into fisheries biology for that exact reason because they're like I you know I love fishing I love fish I want to get into a line of work where I not only get to work with you know what I like but I also get to make a difference by you know doing these studies um, and I could see that being a turnoff for someone who who wants to become a fisheries biologist if they find out that um, they might not make as much of a difference as they could doing something like advocacy work. Yeah, one, one of my favorite things to do every other year, I give a lecture at Montana State University here in Bozeman where I live. And it's a graduate level class of fish and wildlife biology students. And the topic of my talk is how you can pursue uh, a career in fisheries biology in a, with a nonprofit organization. You don't have to go to work for uh, a university or a state wild a fish and wildlife agency or a federal agency. If you go to work for a nonprofit, you get to use all the tools in the toolbox to do what's necessary to protect and restore fish. And that's a really liberating thing for a lot of young students to hear. They, they weren't even aware of that opportunity uh, in many cases before I, I told them about it. And that's probably also pretty nice for, for people who uh, don't want to do the same thing mm -hmm. over and over again. You know, they, they want to have their, their hands all like in all different areas um, maybe spending some time in the field, some time talking to decision makers. Um, people with a couple different interests might be more interested in something like that where you can kind of run the gamut of different activities versus just being strictly science all the time. Yeah, the, the best biologists, the most influential biologists I know, even the ones that work for agencies and, and universities, are the ones that are really good communicators, really good public speakers, really good writers, and they advocate for their science. They know that if they don't speak up in support of, of, of the science that they've produced, then some politician will contort the facts for them and twist it into another story. That's so a good point. I, the best, yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. It, it, it's so frustrating to hear like governors or members of Congress try and talk about how you know, fish can coexist with dams. We just got to give them a chance. <laughs> and they really are totally either unaware of the science or they just try and bury it. And it, yeah, nothing's more maddening to me than, than to hear that. Yeah, I'm sure it's frustrating to have uh, your work interpreted by somebody who's not familiar with it. <laughs> yeah, they talk about how salmon are born in, you know, born in the ocean and then migrate inland to spend their life like in the freshwater river. <laughs> And exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, that would be a deal. Yeah. Uh, so, so give me the elevator pitch for American Rivers, which is where you work now, and and maybe talk a little bit about your role there. Well, I've been with American Rivers for ten years, and I wouldn't have stayed this long if I didn't absolutely love the organization. What I love most about American Rivers is we work on all rivers in all areas of the country, whether they support salmon and steelhead or whether they support you know, like gar and dace and bullhead. Um, we work in cold water rivers, warm water rivers, crystal clear rivers, murky, muddy rivers. Um, and there's just like so many issues on different rivers in different parts of the country. And so, I mean, it, it's a never ending mystery and, and it's a puzzle. And, uh, you know, we, we just get to immerse ourselves in so many different issues. Um, if, if you have a curious mind, it's a wonderful organization to work for if you love water and have a curious mind. Awesome. And you guys have a podcast as well. I just want to throw that out before I forget. Um, if anyone wants to listen to the American Rivers podcast that's out there and they talk a, a lot about 
you know, the, the issues that they're facing right now. Um, but are you specifically working with the wild and scenic rivers? Well, it's interesting because the, the story of American Rivers founding started in 1973, actually in Denver, uh, where you are, and a group of our volunteers actually uh, got together and our founder put $20 on the table and said, we need to form an organization to protect the last best wild rivers, especially in the West before they're all dammed. And like during the 1950s and 60s and early 70s, that was really the height of the dam building era in, in the United States. And Congress had just passed the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in 1968. And for the first time, that gave us a tool to permanently protect wild rivers so we'd never have to fight off dams on those again. And um, because I run our Northern Rockies office, we're, we, we live in a part of the country that's probably the wildest outside of Alaska. So there's a lot of healthy, intact rivers left to protect, whereas a lot of my colleagues in other parts of the country, like the upper Midwest, the mid-Atlantic states, the southeast, even the northwest coast, they tend to focus on restoration more because we've dammed a lot of those rivers, we've polluted a lot of those rivers. Um, but here in the northern Rockies, you know, we really focus on protecting what's left. That was, uh, I was going to get to that later, but that's a perfect segue um, to, to asking, are there a lot, like when I think of wild and scenic rivers, um, what comes to mind is kind of what you described, you know, the Rockies, kind of the, the northern um, central to west U.S., uh, where there are a lot of pristine rivers. Are there any or many um, wild and scenic rivers throughout the rest of the country? Yeah, there are. Um, I mean, it's interesting that the states with the most wild and scenic rivers are, you know, Alaska, California, and Oregon. I think uh, Idaho and then Montana and Wyoming, something like that. So they tend to focus in the northwest quadrant of the country. But... Um, there are some states like Michigan in the Upper Peninsula. There's hundreds of miles of wild and scenic rivers. New Jersey actually has more wild and scenic rivers than Montana. Um, the New England states just got hundreds of new wild and scenic river miles designated this past year. So um, there are wild and scenic rivers all over the country. Um, I used to live when I lived in South Florida as a kid, right next to the Loxahatchee River. Um, which is a really awesome wild and scenic river down by Jupiter, Florida, just um, just north of West Palm Beach. Okay. And um, it's 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 a place I love going back on a regular basis because the southeast coast of Florida has been just absolutely crushed with development over the decades. But when I go back to the Loxahatchee River, and if you look at it on Google Earth, it's just like this emerald green Eden that was somehow spared from all the new condos and high rises. And it really speaks to the power of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act that in a place like South Florida, where there's so much development, you can have a wild river with 500 year old cypress trees in it and tarpon rolling on the water and largemouth bass in the upper reaches. It's a really awesome place to go. That's awesome. I mean, imagine if every you know river out there just had a buffer zone like that around it. You know, how how much nicer they would be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you just have like a 500 foot buffer zone, it's, it's so amazing how much wildlife exists in those narrow areas. I mean, not just the fish, but in places like Montana and Colorado, you know, about 80% of all the bird and mammal species here spend at least half of their life in repairing corridors. Wow. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right. If you can, if you can just set aside like a 500 foot buffer along our rivers, I mean, there's a huge positive impact to wildlife. So what what um, what qualifications does a river need to be, is eligible the right word, eligible to become a wild and scenic river? Or what qualities yeah. do the existing ones have? Well, they generally have to have just two. They have to be free flowing. Okay. So they, they can't be dammed or impounded. And they have to have one or more outstandingly remarkable values. I didn't make up that term. Some some <laughs> congressman did in the late 1960s. I don't think it's an actual word, but um, it exists in the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So generally speaking, the the our federal land management agencies, every time they uh, redo their land management plan, which is every two or three decades, they have to do an inventory of all the rivers on, on that national forest or on that BLM unit. And they have to identify all the rivers that are free flowing and have one or more outstandingly remarkable values, and those become wild and scenic eligible. 
And then it's up to advocacy groups like ours to take those rivers and pitch them in a bill to Congress and build public support for them. Wow. Okay. So that it sounds like um, a pretty well defined process. Even though there's, I, I feel like I would call the the values portion a little vague, but it, I mean it obviously works. What are some of the things well, that count as values? <laughs> it's it's actually really neat, and and they vary by each river and each by each river reach sometimes. But the most common, outstandingly remarkable values, I'll just call them ORVs from now on because it's easier, are. Um, fish, wildlife, recreation, scenery, geology, cultural values. And there's even one river, I'm trying to remember which one it is, that has a literary value. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I can't remember. I wish I could remember which river it was. But one of the cool things about the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, I mean, it's not just a conservation law, but it's also, I mean, it protects recreational values. So if fly fishing is a well-established recreational value on a river like the Gallatin in Montana, then any federally permitted project that comes along that would threaten the health of the fly fishing could be stopped or it'd have to be modified so it didn't harm fly fishing. I like that. That's really cool. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a conservation law, but it's also like a pro recreation law. So who, uh, who decides what this value is? Like who throws out one of these suggestions as like, I would like to submit this as a, an ORV. Well, it's interesting because the ORVs are identified after Congress passes a wild and scenic bill. So for instance, if, if the Gallatin river was designated as wild and scenic within three years of, of the time that bill is passing, the, the Custer Gallatin national forest would have to put together what's called a comprehensive river management plan. I'm getting really into the wonky weeds here. But in that plan, they identify all the outstandingly remarkable values that exist on that river. Oh, okay. So the, ag the agency that manages the land through which the river flows, they put together that, that river management plan. And during that planning process, they identify what the values are. So that value doesn't have to be um, thrown out before uh, the bill is passed. It happens after the bill is passed. Correct. That's interesting. Yep. I would have guessed it's the other way around. So, and also it sounds like a, a river doesn't have to actually be scenic. It could be, that could be a value, but the wild and scenic, you know, it could just be a free flowing river through a, I mean, I assume a, a wild and scenic river probably wouldn't be going through a, a cattle pasture, but it doesn't need to have a calendar worthy background. Yeah. It's like, I mean, the, the wilderness act is different because for lands to qualify as wilderness, they have to be totally unroaded and of wilderness quality. But for a river to be wild and scenic, it just needs to be free flowing and have one or more outstandingly remarkable values. There's one river that got designated as wild and scenic in 2009 in Eastern Massachusetts called the Taunton River. And that actually flows through an industrial city. Really? And the, re <laughs> the reason why it was designated wild and scenic is because the local congressman that led that effort at the time, I think it was Barney Frank, wanted to prevent uh, a, a, an LNG plant, a liquid natural gas plant from being built on the banks of the river. And under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission cannot authorize any projects in the river corridor. So that effectively stopped that natural gas plant from being built on the riverbank. That's crazy. I, I mean, I just assumed like when you when you said that, um, you know, scenery can be a value. Uh, I assumed that for the most part, most of these rivers are very scenic anyway, just, you know, by the nature of being free flowing and having some sort of value that most of them are going to be um, not some, you know, gross river flowing through the middle of a city. But it sounds like <laughs> there, there can be a lot of values that don't actually have anything to do with with how it looks. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, having uh, like unique fish species or endangered fish species or even just native cutthroat trout in the, in the northern Rocky Mountains oftentimes is enough to qualify rivers as wild and scenic eligible. But yeah, there's, there's a whole range of values that, that can factor into the equation. And I think that's one of the really cool things about the law. Yeah, that is really neat. Um, what was I going to ask you? Oh, yes. Do you... Uh, does a river have to have never been dammed or could it have, could there be removed dams and now it qualifies? 
No, that's a, that's a great question. So, like, the perfect example is the Elwha River on, in Olympic National Park in western mm -hmm. Washington state. So, um, as you probably know, the two dams on the Elwha River were removed between 2011 and 2013. And now the entire Elwha River is being proposed for wild and scenic designation as part of the Wild Olympics bill that um, Washington's congressional delegation is carrying. That's awesome. Yeah, um, that happened, on, I believe it happened on Fossil Creek in Wyoming. There was, there was a dam, or excuse me, on, in Arizona, and there was a dam removed, and Fossil Creek was subsequently designated as a wild and scenic river in 2009. Oh, that's awesome. I know you, you wanted to mention, so I had a couple things uh, listed that you wanted to talk about, and this might be a good time, but um, I know one of the things you wanted to mention was the importance of removing dams for... Um, like a proactive protection? Because I know the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act is kind of a, a proactive, um, I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but um, a proactive solution, I guess, to um, the problem instead of trying to bring rivers back. And, and dam removal would obviously be bringing rivers back from uh, a more negative, more negatively impacted uh, situation. But do you want to talk a little bit about dam removal and the benefits that that has? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to give you a good example that, that contrasts the strategy of wild and scenic designation with dam removal. So in Montana, right now, we're working to get a bill introduced to protect, uh, protect over 600 miles of new wild and scenic rivers in the western part of the state. Generally speaking, you know, when we study our campaigns retroactively, we find that it costs about $2,000 a river mile to get a, a river designated as wild and scenic. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll factor in the total cost of the campaign and staff time and paid advertising over a period of, you know, 10 years, and it's about $2,000 a river mile. So the Clark Fork River, the Clark Fork of the Columbia, starts near Butte, Montana, and it flows past Missoula, <clears throat> eventually makes its way into Lake Pondre. It's the largest Superfund site in the United States. For 120 miles, um, that river has been polluted by toxic heavy metals from mining up near Butte and Anaconda. Those toxic heavy metals actually accumulated behind a dam just upriver from Missoula. That dam is called Milltown Dam. And because the dam was over 100 years old, there was this fear that the dam was going to burst at some point and all those toxic heavy metals were going to get into the aquifer of Missoula's drinking water supply. So Milltown Dam was actually removed. And over the last you know 10 years or so, um, the federal government has dredged up a lot of the toxic heavy metals all along the Clark Fork River. And that's costing about $8 million a river mile to restore that river to a semblance of its former glory. Wow. So contrast that with protecting a wild river for $2,000 a river mile versus restoring a badly degraded river from mining for $8 million a river mile. And that shows the power and the wisdom of being proactive. Now, that being said, I mean, we have lots of rivers that have been dammed for many, many years, and in many cases over a century. And we have some amazing opportunities to restore some of the, you know, the world's greatest salmon runs on the West Coast through dam removals, like the Elwha dam removals on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, starting next year, four dams on the Klamath River in uh, Oregon and California are going to be removed, and that's going to be the largest river restoration project in the history of the world, which is really exciting. Um, my Cal California colleagues have been working on that for decades. And then um, kind of the granddaddy of them all um, is the idea of removing four dams on the Lower Snake River in eastern Washington, which would literally open up 5,500 miles of some of the best salmon and steelhead spawning habitat on the face of the earth, mainly in central Idaho, in the, like the Salmon River drainage and Middle Fork Salmon drainage, Clearwater and Selway. So are these places that salmon historically were able to make it up to and are no longer able to make it to at all? Uh, in the case of the Elwha dams, they completely block salmon runs. There's no fish passage. In the case of the lower snake dams, they actually do have fish ladders for adults moving upriver, and they have bypass systems and all sorts of gizmos for helping juvenile salmon get downstream. But despite... 30 years of effort and spending, you know, probably close to $20 billion, that has not worked. I mean, those fish are slipping towards extinction. And, you know, the Snake River Chinook salmon were the greatest Chinook salmon runs on earth. 
I mean, more than half of all the Chinook salmon in the entire Columbia Basin came back to central Idaho and southeast Washington and northeast Oregon to spawn. Um, likewise, the steelhead that used to run up the North Fork of the Clearwater River, they were totally extinguished when Dwarshack Dam was built there near Orofino, Idaho in 1975. So some of those dams we're trying to remove have blocked fish runs for decades. Others have partially blocked fish runs. And in the case of the Lower Snake Dams, again, it's, they partially blocked fish runs, but really driven those stocks towards extinction over the last several decades. That was going to be my next question. What happens to these salmon populations when they can't get back up to spawn? Is it just that way fewer spawn, so there are way fewer born, and the population just goes down? Or are there salmon that just stop returning and they just, you know, there's just a big population that can never come back up the river but still lives out somewhere else? Yeah. What we've historically done when we've destroyed salmon runs is we've replaced the healthy river with a hatchery, and we've, we've had a lot of hubris and thought that we can synthesize new salmon at hatcheries and just release them into the river and those are our new salmon runs. They don't need a wild river to survive. Well, not only is that super expensive, but um, I mean, hatchery fish actually compete with wild fish mm -hmm. and are one of the contributing factors that drive wild fish into extinction. Um, one of the challenges when we let salmon runs get to the point where only single digit number of fish are coming back. Like in the early nineties, only four sockeye salmon came back to Redfish Lake, Idaho, when those Snake River sockeye were listed under the Endangered Species Act. When you lose almost all of your genetic material and those fish disappear, you can't just take a hatchery salmon from the Fraser River in British Columbia and stock it in Redfish Lake, Idaho and expect it to, you know, migrate 800 miles out to the ocean and come back. I like know what to were, do. <laughs> that, was a, that was a unique stock of fish. And, and once they're gone, they're gone. So the critical thing is um, for, for dam removal projects in particular, it really helps with their success if there's some sufficient genetic material left. So once you take that dam out, those fish can naturally recol recolonize the system. If you have to start a run from scratch, it makes it a lot more difficult. Well, yeah, I mean, those fish have been evolving in that environment for how long? And I to to take them out and just replace them with something that just got there yesterday, I, I feel like it's you can't even compare the two. You can't compare the two. I mean, they're totally different species, literally. Yeah. Well, can can a wild and scenic river just... Is it the whole river, or can it be a certain section of river? And if it's just a... If certain sections are, could the river have dams in other areas, but have part of it be wild and scenic? Totally, we have that in many cases. So you can you can just designate a stretch of river, and that river can have a dam upstream or downstream of the free flowing reach, and that's okay. Uh, you just can't build a dam and impound the the water within the wild and scenic reach. So good examples of where we have that: the Snake River through Hell's Canyon on the border of Idaho and Oregon has three major dams on it. Um, the Snake River in Jackson Hole, Wyoming has Jackson Lake Dam just north of a town about 20 miles. So there's a, there's a lot of examples where we have wild and scenic rivers um, with dams either, you know, just upstream or just downstream of the wild and scenic reach. Do you ever have rivers that, um, apart from dam removal itself, that don't qualify until they get some sort of restoration work done to them? Or is, are, are dams kind of the limiting factor on a lot of these designations? Um, I think there are other limiting factors too. Um, you know, sometimes what a river needs to have a restored fishery is, you know, restored riparian vegetation or restored flows. Okay. You know, sometimes in the West, we have a big, big problem that's being exacerbated by climate change of overappropriated rivers where there's like literally no water left in, in rivers in drought years. And if you can get some in-stream flows back for fish and restore a healthy fishery that way, that may make that river qualify for wild and scenic designation based on its fishery value, whereas that didn't exist before the restoration project happened. Okay. That's interesting. Um, what happens to private landowners along a stretch that gets designated? 
Will they get the best insurance policy that money can buy to ensure that the rivers they love is going to stay that way forever? Um, and I, I say that half jokingly, but it's totally true. Uh, wild and tank designation is definitely good for private property values because it ensures that, like I said, that river that you love is going to stay that way. Um, the law itself does not affect private property rights, so it doesn't affect your ability to subdivide your riverfront land or build a cabin. It doesn't dictate what color you can paint your house or or anything like that. So it's one of the great compromises that was made when the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act passed in 1968 is it really doesn't affect private property rights. Have you had any private property owners um, think negatively of it, even though, you know, from the outside looking in, it seems like a, a positive? You know, um, when rivers are proposed for wild and scenic designation, we always get a couple people who, you know, they hear a rumor, you know, they heard at the local bar that, you know, once this creek gets designated as wild and scenic, the federal government's going to come in with their Chinook helicopters and haul your house away. They're going to like condemn all the private land and turn it into a national park. But um, it, it really doesn't take that much research to find out that we've had, you know, over 210 wild and scenic rivers in America, many for many decades, and that's not happened. And pretty much every private landowner that I have spoken with and that um, researchers that study this subject have spoken with, they find that the experience living on a wild and scenic river has been super, super positive. If there's one thing I hear from private landowners, it's when um, there's oil and gas drilling that happens on a river or a dam is proposed on a river or some other form of development, and they say, I wish we had gotten this river designated as wild and scenic before this threat came along. That's that's impressive. Um, I feel like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of issues that for people who value rivers or fish um, or anything like that, you know, it, it appears good to us. But if you know, if you tried to impose anything on a private landowner, um, I think there's a tendency to be defensive. And it's impressive that you you have very little pushback um, f- for something that I would expect you to have more pushback on, I, I guess. Just just from the view of a private landowner who, who thinks, like, I've lived here for, for ages and I don't want there, anything to change. Yeah, we, we've talked to a lot of our private property owners that own ranches or cabins or farms on the upper Missouri River in Montana and the forks of the upper Flathead. And, I mean... They have nothing but great things to say about uh, about the Wild and Sink Rivers Act because they absolutely love those rivers. I mean, they fish on them, they hunt on them, they paddle on them, and um, nothing would break their hearts more than to see the rivers they love be degraded. And And the Wild and Sink Rivers Act is the law that keeps them the way they are. What if a, if a river is designated as wild and scenic, what does that mean going forward in terms of things like development or drilling? Um, Are are there any, what specific protections are in place at that point once something is wild and scenic? Yeah, well, um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds because there's different classifications of wild and scenic rivers, like there's wild, scenic, and recreational, and they're based, uh, those are determined based on the level of development that exists along that river at the time of designation. Okay. So wild rivers are rivers that are like in wilderness areas or roadless areas. Scenic rivers have some road access, but are semi-wild. And then recreational rivers can exist right along a highway. Okay. So, like an example, the Snake River Canyon south of Jackson's right along a highway. Um, We have a lot of rivers like that in the system. Uh, Along wild rivers, new mineral entry is automatically withdrawn. So there's no new mining or oil and gas drilling. Um, Basically, any major extractive activity that is proposed either along a wild and scenic river or upstream of one that could degrade water quality or any of those outstandingly remarkable values is impacted by the wild and scenic designation. So the reach of the act is actually beyond the narrow half mile long corridor along the river. So here's a great example on the Hoback River in Wyoming, which is a tributary of the snake. We got it designated as wild and scenic in 2009. And then a few years later, a Texas-based energy company wanted to drill 136 gas wells at the headwaters where it was not designated as, as wild and scenic because it was in a different county and and the politics in that county were really conservative and they didn't want the wild and scenic designation. Anyway, um, we helped 
stop that gas drilling proposal because we showed the energy company that if they conducted those activities, there's no way they could do it without degrading the water quality downstream in the wild and scenic reefs. And that really brought them to the negotiating table and working with some great conservation partners. We all worked together on a, an oil and gas lease buyout and raised almost $10 million to buy out those drilling rights. And now um, that area has been congressionally withdrawn from all new energy development. That's awesome. So it's kind of like a, a watershed wide protection just by default. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different. But like with wilderness, there are no buffer zones. And like, a, you know, uh, if an area is designated as a wilderness area, you can't necessarily stop a coal fired power plant from polluting 200 miles away and having the haze drift over the wilderness sure. area. But, but with the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, the, the power of that law can extend um, all throughout the watershed. So any federally permitted activity that would degrade water quality or the special values of that river could be impacted by the designation. And I mean that in a good way. <laughs> it sounds to me like you should go to the mouth of every river and uh, just protect like the last mile of it, just so nothing upstream of it can can be <laughs> attacked, you know? Yeah. Yeah, or, or if you actually protect, like, you know, if one of the values of a designated river in central Idaho, like the Salmon River, is anadromous fish runs, and then a dam is proposed way downstream that would block those fish from getting, uh, you know, further oh. up into the wild, that's another example of how wild and scenic could come into play. That's really cool. So it, it could be a downstream issue, too, just as long as something's traveling upstream, it would still count. Exactly. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that is, that's really neat. Have you noticed, so I assume that there's, I don't, I, maybe this assumption is wrong. If there have been um, concerns from people about, you know, an economic impact of a wild and scenic designation. So let's say someone wants to argue that, um, a, you know, an economic uh, problem will happen because of, you know, less extraction or something like that. Is is there any um, evidence for a boost in economic activity around, you know, people coming to, you know, maybe in a recreational river, people coming to use that river, or in a wild river, people coming to fly fish that river? Or um, is there any sort of um, data behind that? You know, it's interesting. It's a double-edged sword because some communities, when they, they want to get a, a wild and sink river designated in their backyard, they want to attract more tourists. They want to attract more paddlers and you know, it's good for the business community. The Chamber of Commerce gets behind it. It's easy to get elected officials behind it because it's good for business. And then you have other areas where people just love the stream the way it is, and they really don't want any more people coming to it. And we tell those communities, like, hey, listen, it, it, it's whatever you want. If you want to just protect this river and keep it the way it is, then don't take out a, a multi-million dollar advertising campaign telling people all over the world to come to your river. But if you do want that, then Wild and Scenic is a really good, it's really good marketing value. And after we got 400 river miles around Jackson Hall, Wyoming designated, the local chamber of commerce actually ran full page newspaper ads all over the Rockies, touting the fact that Teton County, Wyoming had more Wild and Scenic rivers than any county in America. <laughs> I wonder if it, so, it just correlates to, you know, if you're a tourist town, anything to get more tourists. And if you're not a tourist town, then you can just lay low and and pretend it's not happening <laughs> yeah and we we do hear from a lot of people especially in small communities they're like you know we just want to keep our stream the way it is we don't want more people and if you can help us get it designated wild and scenic so so the river's not dammed or so it's not polluted by oil and gas drilling then that'd be great but we're, we don't want to market this huh do you know how? Do you happen to know if it increases property values along the river? Because I know if I'm if I were looking at a property, I'd definitely be willing to pay a little bit more if I saw that it it you know bordered a wild and scenic river. Yeah, you know I'm not aware of any like published studies that show that. I mean, there's a lot of anecdotal information okay. showing that um, the private property on wild and scenic rivers probably increases in value greater than than riverfront property on a river that's not protected. Um, but you can't really prove that through peer reviewed research. At least I'm not aware of it yet. Fair enough. And I'm sure that that also just goes case by case. You know, if someone's willing to pay for it, then, then that person selling might get a boost. 
Um, whereas someone else might just want the house and, and not care too much. But I, I mean, I know, like you said, if, if they choose to use it as advertising, they might get more tourists. And I, I know that if I were, you know, planning a trip to Montana and I was just looking for a place to fish, if I saw two rivers side by side on a page and one was listed as wild and scenic and one wasn't, I know which one I'm going to. And that's kind of how I feel about, if, you know, two, two houses are, are all else equal. I would definitely choose the one that I'm, I know I'm not going to have to worry about my river getting ruined down the, down the road. Yeah. The, you know, the interesting thing is one of the major reasons why rivers don't get protected as wild and scenic is because people are so afraid that if it's protected, it'll attract more people that they'd rather not take that risk. But the, the fact of the matter is, I mean, for in, in Montana, for instance, two of the most popular rivers as far as angler days are the Madison River and the Yellowstone River. And I'll, I'll add the Smith River is definitely one of the most sought after fishing experiences in Montana. None of those rivers are designated as wild and scenic. So, wow. I mean, wild and scenic does not result in crowding. What results in crowding is the fact that people have seen pictures of a river, they've read stories in fishing magazines about the river, and it's got a really healthy fishery and you can catch lots of fish and there's pretty scenery and that's why they go. People generally don't go to wild and scenic rivers like they go to national parks. They're, yeah. they're a lower profile designation. Yeah, and I'm thinking about it, I mean, what are some of the most popular fishing waters out there tailwaters which are you know obviously dammed so yeah yeah i mean i'm thinking of the places in colorado i was surprised and i don't know if this has changed because i haven't looked in the past year or so probably <clears throat> but last time i looked there was only one wild and scenic river in colorado and it was the cash lapooter up um i guess probably just west of fort, fort collins Pond. yeah and thinking thinking about all the rivers i fished uh that doesn't even come close to the busiest one Totally. And yep. all the busiest ones are tailwaters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The Blue River, Gunnison. I mean, yeah. yeah. There's a, any number you can pick. Um, so one more thing I know you wanted to cover before we wrap up is uh, the effects that climate change has had on all this. Yeah. You know, a lot of anglers in particular are, are super aware of what climate change is doing to our rivers as far as we're getting you know, the snowpacks melting off earlier. We're hitting our, uh, our our base flows earlier in the summer. Water temperatures are going up. Algae blooms are prolifer proliferating. Um, on rivers like the Yellowstone, we're actually starting to see smallmouth bass uh, move further and further upstream, all the way up to Livingston, where you know 20 years ago there were never any smallmouth bass up that far. So those are the common impacts of climate change that most anglers see on the ground if they're, if they're actually on the water all the time. Um, but what most people don't think about is with climate change, it's really increased the demand for new water storage projects, which means new dams. It's increased the demand for new carbon-free energy sources, which can be hydropower. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of indirect effects of climate change that pose really, really huge threats to some of our most valued rivers especially in the West. I'd never thought of that before. I, you know, I, I, I think about the effects of climate change in terms of just a, you know, one-to-one -one cause relationship um, where, you know, the climate changes and the water is affected in this way or the fish are affected in this way. But uh, it didn't occur to me that something like water storage, you know, that, that's a huge thing on a river. You know, if you need to dam a river, that's going to completely change the course of the river. So even if those fish weren't directly affected by, you know, changing weather, they could be, you know, affected even more so, arguably, by by humans' reaction to a changing climate. Yeah, one of the things that American Rivers does, I think is this is super cool, our California office, um, they do a lot of subalpine meadow restoration on the foothills of this year in Nevada. Mm -hmm. So, like, literally a century ago, there was a ton of sheep grazing. John Muir wrote a lot about it in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. And because of that historic overgrazing, um, you have a lot of ravines and eroded areas. So when the snow melts off, it just cascades straight down uh, to lower elevations and you mm -hmm. lose that snowpack. By restoring these meadows and like plugging these deeply incised ravines and, and replanting wetlands vegetation, you can actually store water in there like a sponge and we're quantifying how much water you can store in these restored meadows 
and, so, and we're convincing communities, instead of building new dams on rivers, if you just restore these meadows, you, you can store that water in a really natural way that benefits the environment and you get the water that you need in the future. That's really cool. So it, does it turn essentially into a wetland or would it still be, if you're walking through it, would it still be like a meadow? Uh, it's kind of a mix of both. A lot of those meadows do have wetlands in them, mm-hmm. but um, they, they literally act as a natural sponge, a natural reservoir. So when that snow melts off, it percolates down into the soil and then slowly kind of moves downstream through the system before it reaches the ocean instead of cascading off through these eroded ravines and making it to the ocean a lot quicker. So it sounds like the the added benefits in addition to just the water storage, I assume there's there's just fewer eroded areas, you know, like areas that can become healthier with more plants. Um, does it also filter the water and make it a little cleaner? It does, absolutely, yeah. So a nice, nice side effect. So that, that, yeah, that's an example of like a green infrastructure or natural infrastructure. And that's one of the things that makes American rivers pretty unique is not only do we protect wild rivers and restore degraded rivers, but we work in urban areas to um, to build new green infrastructure to reduce stormwater runoff, which reduces water pollution that makes its way into our rivers and degrades fisheries. So we work in cities like you know Toledo and Atlanta and Milwaukee and Washington D.C. to build rain gardens and and bio swales and all this cool green infrastructure that at first glance you'd say what does that have to do with rivers? And it all has to do with slowing down runoff and filtering runoff so pollutants don't make their way into our mainstream rivers. Well, I'm sure a lot of people can get behind that, even just, you know, even if they don't care about the, you know, effects that, you know, cleaner water or things like that, just I think most people would agree that having, um, you know, more intact habitats with lots of plants and animals uh, is going to be a lot nicer to be around than a dam. That and like, you know, it's much cheaper to preserve a wetland or to restore a wetland to filter pollutants out, uh, out of our water than it is to build uh, like a, a water treatment plant. Mm-hmm. So using natu- natural infrastructure, it saves communities like billions of dollars a year and it's beneficial to the environment. And less prone to accidents and breaking. This is very true. All right, Scott. Well, this is a... Uh a great chat. I, l- I learned so much about the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and, and the rivers themselves that I I feel like that fact about the um, salmon migrating upstream, that may have been my favorite thing I learned today. <laughs> um, uh, do you want to share where people can find uh, either you or uh, American Rivers or any, any other places you want to send people? Sure. I mean, American Rivers, obviously we have a website, AmericanRivers.org. We've got a really active Facebook page. We actually um, have lots of short films on our website, which is really cool on films between two minutes and 15 minutes long. Um, I think we've got 15 to 20 of them on our website now. It's a great way to learn about our work in a really creative, entertaining way. So I really encourage people to check out the short films on our website. And um, you know, we've got offices all around the country. I'm based in Bozeman, Montana, right in downtown Bozeman on Main Street. And uh, anyone can go to our website and find out where our offices are. And um, we love meeting with our members and supporters and, and hearing their concerns and teaching them more about our work. Awesome. Well, I hope, uh, I hope people check out American Rivers and, and maybe make some time to go visit one of these wild and scenic rivers that you guys have been working on. It's my favorite thing to do. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Scott. And I hope you uh, have a great rest of your evening. Thanks, and have a great Thanksgiving. All right, you too. All right, and that'll do it. As always, if you liked what you heard, go ahead and go over to the Wild Initiative podcast. You can subscribe there and get my shows biweekly on Thursdays, as well as all of Sam's other shows throughout the week. You can also find all my episodes on fishuntamed.com, in addition to backcountry fly fishing articles. You can find me on social media under my name, Katie Burgert, on Go Wild or at Fish Untamed on Instagram. And I will see you all back here in two weeks. All right. Bye, everybody.